joining us. I'm Paul Wilson. And I'm Chris Hemke. And this is Diesel Performance Podcast. Guys, we got a great episode put together for you today. We're going to be talking about the difference between 49 and 50 state uh, tuning and turbo, just 49 and 50 state approval, yeah. uh, what that means for you. Before we get started, of course, we want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Duramax Tuner, Calibrated Power. That's where Chris and I are at every day. We love it over here. Yeah. Uh Man, we, we got some really cool products that have been super popular lately that we've talked about a bunch. L5P Stealth STR jumps to mind yeah. uh, and some other cool stuff going on. Black box tuner with the power strokes. But one of the things that I'm looking for, especially around this time of year, is all the new products that we're talking about releasing here in the mm-hmm. near future. So I don't want to... Don't want to jump the gun on anything. I want all all the ducks to be in a row before we announce them. But can I just say, keep a really, really close eye on the social media feeds uh, for Duramax Tuner, uh, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, whatever you're on. Uh, we're going to have some big announcements coming up here in the very, very near future. We have new new product lines as far as turbochargers go, uh, tuning support on some of the newer platforms yeah. that you know has been kind of gray area <laughs> over the last <laughs> you know year or so so we're really excited we've we've done a couple social media posts recently kind of little teasers and whatnot and guys are guys are getting amped yeah. you know so many questions <laughs> so many questions so you know we're we're really excited and you know i'm thankful to to be a part of that um you know speaking of new products and stuff like that you know wc fab uh longtime sponsor of the show uh jason and the boys over there got a lot of crazy stuff you know cooking up they've they've done a lot of discontinuing on some of their products that they've had over the years and it's given them an opportunity to do a revamp yeah. um, on some of their products so you know it's really cool to see uh they had some of their displayed products at the pri trade show um so they're gonna be coming to market with that here i believe in the next month or so so you know on top of all the cool colors and everything else that they have going on it's cool to uh you know see them kind of revive some of their product line and do some redesigns that's right uh xdp you know them as your one-stop shop for diesel performance if you're looking for anything out of the duramax tuner or wc fab catalog uh you generally can jump on over to xdp check out and see what they have available there uh I love working with XTP because they also are, are another company that's grown in the new product segment. So yeah. they do a lot of in-house manufacturing and in-house kind of part creation. Uh, so definitely check out what they have going on. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. And then last but not least, Exergy Performance. I'm pretty sure, aside from the sponsorship readout, Exergy gets brought up in every one of our podcasts, from <laughs> customer <laughs> interviews to fuel system spec. Like, they are a household name when it comes to common rail performance and you know just common rail upgrades for injectors and pumps, and rightfully so. You know they're. Uh, you know, probably one of the more consistent brands that yeah. we've dealt with over the years. And, uh, you know, you're starting to see them pop up more and more through different retailers and kind of expand their product line as well. So it seems like 23, man, is just a year of growth and a year of, you know, potential new opportunity and it, whatnot. It really is. And and, and I think all, all of the, the new products kind of focus around today's topic, which is 49 state and 50 states. So as we mentioned, WC Fab had to uh, reduce some of their catalog there for a while. Same thing Duramax Tuner went through it years ago. XDP, I know, is going yeah. through it now. Uh, and Exergy, I'm sure, is in the same boat. So all of the the companies that are in diesel performance who would like to be in diesel performance five years from now have all been faced with a new reality. And that's that there is going to be government oversight over the parts that you manufacture and sell. So it's mm-hmm. not just being enforced on the end users. It's being forced on the suppliers, which, which is companies like us. Um, it, it is so murky out there of people actually grasping and understanding oh. what these terms mean. So I mean, let, 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 let's lay that landscape out. Yeah. Right. Paul, we've been in this industry. We've worked here, you know, arguably nine, ten years now, right? Sure. So pretty much a decade. And we have seen terminology come and go. <laughs> we have seen companies come and go. Yep. And I think one of the stickiest things here are, you know, we had a customer that came in house from Alaska. Okay. We did a truck for him, did some tuning back, you know, nine years ago. And he's got a new truck. He he actually moved somewhat to the area and he wanted to come by and visit. And, uh, you know, he's, he's asking me about terms. I went on the website. What's the 49 state? What's the 50 state? Yeah. Well, back then, you know, we would do intakes, exhaust, and, you know, what about the catalytic converter? What about this? <laughs> what about that? And, um, you know, he mentioned a couple of things as far as terminology and references have changed, right? The term legal and illegal. 
the yeah. term ro- off-road and on-road. Well, you know what the term <laughs> off-road or on-road meant 10 years ago sure. you know, versus what it means now. And um, its impact literally has n- no value <laughs> Tur- <laughs> you know, yeah, when, yeah. You, when you say Tur- that. Turns out as enthusiasts what we call things and what's recognized like legally in yeah. a court or by government agencies – very, very different worlds. We used to think it, it, what you're referencing to there is thinking that if you call the product for off-road use only, that meant that it wouldn't safe. have any EPA regulations. Now, if you looked at how the EPA and how how Clean Air uh, Resource Board has been enforced on like agricultural equipment, which is also off-road use like products yep. fr- from the OEM they've all had emissions enforced on them. Yep. So they have to meet the same emission standards as everybody else. So calling your product off-road, even though we all thought for a long time that that was going to be some sort of a, a loophole, uh, it was not. Yep. That, that one was shut down pretty quickly. So so as, and then, God, we dealt with what? Probably a good five, six years of just all sorts of different creative names for well, code words for delete. I've always. The Jenny Craig diet. I've, oh, God. <laughs> I've always thought of like the diesel world over the last decade just being in the wild, wild west. Yeah. And now there's finally some, you know, uh, some <laughs> legal guidelines and things that need to be, you know, kind of uh, maintained with, you know, any any company, any shop. But they're they're really, you know, kind of leaning on the bigger companies that uh, have gone through some of these uh, growth hurdles. Yeah, I think is a yeah. Good way to put it. Yeah. So so EPA started really whacking guys. I think it got real popular in like 13 was probably the biggest announcements that yeah. I remember. H and S. H and S. And then Edge's stuff came out came into light that they were going to get whacked for a couple mil yeah. and and then then they 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 kind of worked through these the biggest names down to the smallest names and and we've talked about this a bunch on the show. Yep. Uh, they would guys ask on the show. people. Yeah, we've had guys on the show. They would ask people, "Who are you buying your parts from? Who's your top 5 suppliers? Yep. Who's your top 5 customers?" things like that. And really working their way through the entire industry uh to where even small guys like like we mentioned, um you know, when they get whacked, I mean, we just talked to somebody who's on mm-hmm. still on house arrest uh yep. because of owning a company that participated in deletes. So deletes have gotten less and less popular. There's more and more people that are looking at emissions equipped performance and saying, okay, we're going to leave the emissions on. We don't want to get our company shut down. We don't want to go serve jail time for this shit. Let's just follow the rules. What are the rules? Three years ago, what are the rules was a pretty wild fucking answer because really – Nobody knew. No. There was all sorts of really how, vague terms. How did you interpretate this line item? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot more uh, clear understanding, right? There's yeah. a lot more black and white. And, you know, Paul, walk me through, right? When we talk about legal tuning, okay? So yep. legal tuning, it, it, can I remove emissions? Are emissions staying on the truck? Is legal tuning a 49 state? Is it legal depending on the state? Like, what are those basic terminologies of question. legal tuning, 49 state tuning, and then 50 state? I love love this. Number one, I want to give the, the disclaimer off the top. We are not lawyers. We are not giving no. advice about what is and what isn't legal. We are defining these terms to the best of our ability for how we interact with them. And that, that's mm-hmm. the best we can do for you. So legal tuning. Uh, to be to be legal in the United States across all 50 states um, – to be sure that you are legal, you have to have some sort of testing pr- proving that what the modification you made to the vehicle is not increasing the emissions. Mm-hmm. That, that's the simplest I could put it. Now, there is a large question over how you prove that. Do you prove the theory? Do you prove it on every single model and every single truck? Can you, if you test a single uh, or a regular cab, and you test a dually. Are you going to get the exact same result? What is what what is a reasonable basis? And that that's what what we're looking for from the EPA. So the EPA has defined they are looking for a reasonable basis that your product does not harm the emissions output. It does not increase the the amount of uh, pollutants. And there's put a threshold the that you're that you're given, yeah. right? Like there's this. You have to be within this tolerance. You have to be within this threshold for you know it to be you know. Uh, Okay, and that's based on the test. So, okay. so there is a standardized test that that they've approved. That they said we will use this test. It basically runs you through a bunch of different driving scenarios. You're on and off the throttle. It's very sim- similar to the. Um, it is what was based off of for 
for the driving portion of Diesel Power Challenge in the last few years of that competition. Uh, but you're on the dyno. You're going through a lot of different throttle inputs, a lot of different driving scenarios, different loads, and then you're testing the the gas that's coming out of the exhaust to make sure that, like I said, you're not increasing the amount of pollutants or you're within a reasonable threshold. Um, that would make, if you have some sort of reasonable basis, that would say, okay, you're good, right? Um, that would make you also 49 state compliant. So there is no official stamp that the EPA has or a process that the EPA has to say, boom, you are 49 state compliant. Mm -hmm. um, you more are operating from a reasonable basis. And if you get caught breaking the rules, that's when all hell breaks loose. So one of the things that I see with uh, tuning companies and you know, uh, way end users kind of interpret some of this is, there are guys out there that will say, okay, we're doing emissions on tuning, but we're shutting the def off. Or we're doing emissions <laughs> present tuning, but your EGR is is going to be commanded <coughs> off. Or I'll get inquiries of like, hey, I don't care to leave the emissions on the truck. I just want my EGR turned off or shut off. Yeah. I love that. The so emissions need to function. The emissions need to operate in a in a in a way that it was designed from OEM. There you go. Right. So the term the term I've read is is defeating emissions. I think that's the big the big misconception that end users and maybe some of these smaller shops have is well, I didn't remove it. Well, removal's not what's actually written into law uh, for the EPA or for carbon. We'll get into carbon fifty yep. state and what that means in just a minute here, but but to, to drill in on that, Chris, that's such a good fucking point. Um, <laughs> the, the term is defeating emissions. And if you think about the difference between between those words, deleting it and removing it from your truck, yep. that, that's what deleting means, or to defeat it means to figure out a way to make it not effective. Right. Right. So the whole end game is what is the what is the testing going to be at the tailpipe? It's actually tailpipe emissions. That's mm -hmm. what they care about. So if you turn the EGR off, we know that you're going to increase your NOx output. There's no two ways about yep. it. That is what the EGR, that's like the main emissions function of EGR. There's all sorts of other side benefits we've talked about. But the main emissions function is to reduce NOx. DEF is after the same goal. It's also extremely effective at reducing NOx emissions. Um, if you turn one of those off, you are fairly guaranteeing that you are not legal. No. That that you you have in fact defeated the emissions equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's that's another one of those fun loopholes that guys just really really are trying to play with the wording on that I yeah. think maybe they just haven't read the original text. Well, I mean, a couple of years ago, you know, you'd see tuning companies advertising exactly that, you oh, yeah. know, and again, it was all about interpretation. You know, we've seen some other companies, you know, kind of take the brunt of that and they've been made an example out of. And sure. There's been uh, other, you know, behind the scenes situations take place, which it's made companies be a little bit more aware and a little bit more careful on their choices, I yep. think is probably a good way to put it. So I always get a lot of guys that will call in, you know, shop owners, right? And they're like, hey, we're looking for these upgrades, you know, but we don't want to do tuning. We're staying away from tuning. All tuning is illegal. <laughs> well, that's also not accurate. Like, there isn't anything being said or discussed that tuning is illegal. It's the style of tuning that could potentially be illegal based off of what the tuner is choosing to do in the calibration. That's right. That's so right. is the elite tuning illegal? Yes. Simple answer. The elite tuning or emissions defeat tuning at any level yeah. is what is illegal. Yeah, yeah, there is no loophole. There's, no. there's no a lot. Long time has been discussed over, over. Could can we get around this with legal language? The answer is no. Uh, if you do anything to your vehicle tuning, turbo, whatever, if you do anything to your vehicle that is going to significantly increase the tailpipe emissions of uh, what have been deemed uh, dangerous pollutants. You you have broken the law. You have violated the the, the statutes or whatever the, the whatever correct terminology the correct term is. is. Now now as we move into this, we we have proof that that you do. There is a way to legally tune trucks, yeah. uh, and and that could be whether it's forty nine state or fifty state. So forty nine state simply means you have a reasonable basis, whatever that is. Uh, fifty states a little bit more clear. Yeah. So fifty state means you've gone to CARB, the California Air Resource Board. 
and you have submitted your testing documentation, meaning that your truck's been run through the standardized national and I believe there's also a separate carb test, so they have to run through through all of the required testing. Uh, and you actually submit the application with the testing. You talk with the people at CARB, so you actually get a rep, and you actually have to interact with them. It's not just straight application read. I'll yep. tell you that from experience. Um, and they then deem whether or not your product and that SKU or that part number, however you want to break it down, uh, is going to get an executive order. The executive order states clearly you are legal to be sold in the state of California. And that's the gold standard. That's it. EPA, uh, Canada, everybody accepts a CARB EO. So a CARB EO, an executive order, they give you a number. Ours, like at Durham Exchange, like D845 was, was our first one, right? You don't rememorize that. Um, so, so you get an EO number. You, you are required to provide a sticker that is to be placed under the hood. It actually has to be like certain materials that it could be high temp and weather resistant mm -hmm. and all that all that fun fun details um they approve your product they approve your SKU number they approve like for us for tuning calibration they they dive into this calibration this is not simply run the test okay we trust you you have to have a way to mark the calibration so yeah. that they know what it is if they were to go look at it down the road mm -hmm. um so so you then get an approval you are now are allowed to be sold now one of the things I always like to bring up when we talk about this is it is CARB, the California Air Resource Board. Most, The most heavy enforcement in the country that we know of is in California. Right. But there are several other states that have adopted CARB standards. Now, some of these states have adopted CARB standards for new car manufacturing only. Some of these states have adopted CARB standards for older vehicles as well. Yep. So, so you have to look into your local area and find out what are my state rules. I think so often, Chris, we get guys who say they don't do emissions testing right. in my town. Well, and you're like, well, <laughs> that's the, the thing that it, it, even me being in the industry, it took a little while to understand. Right. Yeah. There is a difference between a state law or a local ordinance of what's going to be chosen to be enforced versus a federal law. Right. Okay. And what we're talking about from an emissions perspective, 49 state, 50 state, these are all federal legal situations. These aren't. You know, um, for example, I've had guys that they're in certain areas and they've never had emissions testing. Well, new calendar year comes up. Now their trucks are being forced to get, you know, emissions tested. Yeah. But it was never that way before because in their area it wasn't enforced. Well, and I always laugh about that because I always say I've, I've never known a county, I've never heard of a county anywhere in the United States to reduce their emissions enforcement. No. It's only increased year over year and it's only spread to to become more. I've never seen the shift back right. or a pendulum swing. It's only more. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. So so CARB CARB is a state state enforcement, right? So CARB rules can only be enforced in California. There are other states that could adopt those standards. They could be in a state law. Defeating emissions, that's 50 state. That's across the entire country. It's yeah. also across Canada. Um, so there, there's real questions about what the process is. I think that, I think that's what we run into the most often of, of, well, why don't you just go and submit all of your products and get all of your products 50 state, and then you're done, and then there is no 49 state anything. That'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, we just got our EO for Cummins tuning, yep. 15 to 20. Uh, we have it set up on three different types of hardware. We submitted the application three years ago. Yep. We just want to let that sit in. Three years yep. since we submitted the application. Do you remember? That's insane. Do you remember what was tested and what we have data on prior to that that we're still working on? Yeah, I think turbos are still turbos. in the pipeline. Turbos are still in the pipeline, right? Yeah. So we have a lot of testing. We did in-house testing. We did third-party testing. Like. Not not to talk about us, but like we've been through the process. Yeah. The process is a process. So when you see or read about guys, you know, talking about emissions testing, internal testing is complicated, but it's not overly complex. When you have gone through that gold standard, you know, and, yeah. and a vehicle has been shipped to California, or you have rented a vehicle to have your parts tested on through CARB, like that's a serious endeavor. There's a lot of money. There is a lot of time. There is a lot of resources. There's a lot of belief in the product going to that extent. That's the true testimonial of, hey, this is going to work or it's not going to work. Yeah. And keep in mind, right now, especially early on, if you look back three years ago when we first started going after uh, EO numbers, 
there's really only one logical avenue to have any of your testing done. You could submit the, the paperwork yourself, but the actual testing, the only place I know of was SEMA Garage. Yep. SEMA Garage is a gold standard type of a company. They are the top notch of what they do. Right. Their emissions testing and their emissions testing package of their service to deal with them. It, it really, really at the time, especially was was, was second. There, there, yep. there was no other option, and you really, we weren't sure how many other options we were going to need. But it, it, you're talking about a five figure number. So you're talking about at least ten thousand dollars to do it, and then like you mentioned, mm -hmm. the logistics of doing it is it, it's it's getting the vehicle there. They have to baseline it with whatever stock, stock turbo components. in this in this case, right? Stock turbo. Then you have to pay for the labor because they then have to switch it. So even though you own a shop where we do labor, you can't like send your guy down there to go do it. You have yeah. to pay them to go and do it. Okay, cool, whatever. You know, hey, we're a company. It's an investment. Sure. Then they get it done. They give you this test letter. Basically, with that test letter, the current belief is that test letter, if you pass that test, you are now 49 state pretty indisputable right. because you have testing to show you've proven your reasonable basis is, would be really hard to argue in court at least from anybody who's talked to us about it but you're not done no, <laughs> no. well i mean look at look at the coming stuff right and like let, let we could blame COVID a little bit for this because i think that put a, sure. a big derail on a lot of uh progress but like three years three years three years you know yeah. there are other companies in this industry that have been being very vocal about having a lot of EOs tied up for for timelines longer than what we have. Oh yeah, right. So, you know, as as you're looking at doing upgrades to a truck or talking about tuning on a truck, yes, things have changed. the prog The process has changed. the The level of standard of if you're putting a good product on your truck has changed. It's it's grown. It's matured. Right. Um, but in no way, shape, or form would I sit there and say it's dead. Yeah, no, I, I think that's even proven by those timelines. One of the reasons that those timelines have gotten bad, you're absolutely right, COVID, they, they reduced personnel yep. who are on site and all that. But as things have gotten back, it's not like we've picked back up to full speed. Because mm -hmm. what we've noticed is every automotive aftermarket manufacturing company in the country is now pursuing some sort of EO. And I mean, if they're not, they're probably... They are. It's in their plans. It's in any their goal company, list. Whatever it is. Any any serious company that has roots in in the automotive industry yeah. is doing something to put forth energy to making sure that their roots are planted. I jumped on. I jumped on Carb the other day. I was on their website and I was looking for other manufacturers that had EO numbers already issued for turbochargers. Yep. Um, I exported the file into Excel and it was. It was obscene at the number of companies that you've never heard of because you got to remember reman companies who supply like AC Delco, reman companies who supply O'Reilly's and, and Napa Auto Parts. Yep. All of those turbochargers now have to go through some sort of documentation. It wasn't just the guys doing S400s, right? right? Like it, it was everybody in the industry. So everybody is trying to go in and get an EO or everybody is trying to go in. It's gotten to the point that SEMA has said, hey, we've improved our timelines. We'll give you the SEMA promise. And you now can actually go to SEMA and have your stuff tested. And if it tested SEMA, they say, we promise that this will meet CARB standards. Right. So so it's like a 49-state stamp from SEMA. I, I think it's a cool marketing thing. I, I like what they're doing. I really, really do. I love the guys over at SEMA. We've talked to them a bunch. Um, I, but, but I think that just, again, shows you it like – how slow and involved this process is. So so that's why you're going to end up with 49 state and 50 state. There's also a reality to some of the older trucks out there, Chris, and I think that's something that we we miss often. It's really easy to look at 2000, we'll just say 2012 and newer. So we got past most of the trash first-gen emissions equipment. Right. We got into all the LML stuff, everything after that. I think everybody understands, yeah, you can't hack off a DPF. What do you do with an LB7? Is it legal to sell an exhaust for an LB7? Like a four-inch straight pipe exhaust? I mean, it. I don't know. You know, I I feel like uh, I feel like from what I have seen on websites, right, for mm -hmm. companies that are more or less enforcing certain things, a four-inch exhaust for a vehicle and an upgrade would only make sense if there was never a catalytic converter, which I believe Federal Emissions LB sevens didn't have cats in 0102. Okay, but if I increase, if I decrease the back pressure in the exhaust. 
and I just allow more air to flow, mm-hmm. would I have any reason to believe that my emissions would go my emissions would get worse. I would have more pollutants in the air. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know the answer to this question. What I can tell you is, it's hard to find an LB7 straight pipe four inch exhaust right now. No, like, like I mean, there's there's the a number couple of companies that are selling yeah. those dramatically oh, yeah. reduced. I look at you know uh, you know being in more of that the common side of things and seeing things over time. You know, you can you can go online right now and buy like a four inch or a five inch for an O three O four truck. But you can't find an exhaust for an 04 and a half to 07 because those had cats. Yeah. Right? So you see, you've seen a huge shift and a huge change regarding options for, you know, those yeah. those types of vehicles. Now, let's flip flip that around and let's look at the gasoline industry. I know, like, being in some of, like, the LS platforms and stuff, like, you know, you you, you could buy a full exhaust system, but they're all sold in sections. You buy a cat pack, you know, a cat pack exi- <laughs> uh, exhaust system, and then you can buy high flow cats with long tube headers, and you know, you could buy, you know, Catadex pipes or non Catadex pipes, you know, but it's the diesel industry has been so spoiled over the years that you were able to buy a full exhaust, put it on the truck, and it was a full one and done. Where in like the gasoline industry, you know, uh, at least what I've seen in the LS or in some of like the the Dodge stuff or you know the the, the Hellcat SRT stuff, they're usually all sold in sections, and you can kind of piece together to make it legal, you know, or whatever yeah. that case may be. I just feel like in the diesel stuff, it was so cookie cutter like you could just go and do whatever at any local store the, and there, there's a reason for the you know everything I, I, to come down i remember when the biggest question around exhaust was four inch or five inch yeah and aluminum or stainless, stainless. steel and i just, then, I just and want then, that sound man between, i just want that loud diesel sound between manufacturers the yeah. only differentiating thing i remember was how easy their hangers installed because yeah. they all worked on the same yeah. hangers and it was just it was really all the clamps who mapped it some, better. Some people had like crimping clamps, some people had like band clamps. Yeah. You know, you would see that and yeah, I mean, realistically, it was the exhaust could all came from the same warehouse. You wouldn't have known a difference. No, I, it was, it's metal tube. Yeah, like like that's that's just what it was. But the, those were the big questions we we asked and and talked about when it came to exhaust. Um, you know, some some things outside of the aftermarket industry have made some of this possible. Emissions equipment has gotten more reliable over they time have. in a in a very general sense. If you look at 07 and a half when DPFs uh, first hit the scene, and even in twelve when when everything then had DAF, I think in twelve. Yeah, it depends on what your model you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but by twelve, everything, everything. got yep. DAF. Yep. Um, some of those early generations, yeah, man, there was massive failures. We knew it then. We we talked about it then. Yeah. We were very open about like, hey, the, mean, let, let's, the newer it is, the better it is, yeah. and that's I mean, still true today. Let's be transparent, right? Like, there's still failures. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, we had a RAF last year of you know 2020 Duramax, you know, plus stuff, you know, having def feeder issues. You know, yep. like we're not sitting there saying that everything is bulletproof, but at the same time. I've also seen 10,000 mile trucks have bad injectors, or 20,000 mile trucks have bad turbochargers. Seen or brand new Cummins turbochargers pumps. not ha- pass a li- boost test yeah. on the turbocharger, yeah. not even on the piping, just no, the just face the of the itself. cover leaking. So, you know, the, the thing I've always joked around with was like, well, you, you wanted the newer amenities of a newer vehicle. The, the newer vehicle has more moving components. If, if the turbo, the water pump, the injector pump, if the injector, if one of those things failed, you couldn't go and ride a tune to shut those things off and punch <laughs> in the truck, you know? So, No, I'd like a non-turbo L5P. That sounds great. That's, that'd be sweet. That's like really your speed, I feel. That's like, yeah. like a 9,000-pound turd just Dude. slowly chugging down the road. Oh, we get that 7.3 back from back in the old days. <laughs> Shit. But it's just, like I said, you know, with this, there's just, there's so many terminologies, right? Yeah. There's so many, well, my buddy said this, or this isn't enforced in my area. Well, it's funny that it might not be enforced in your area, but the shop that did the delete in the first place, they're now on the hook for whatever they did to your vehicle that wasn't enforced in that spot from federal versus... Very, you know. very good point. Where, where, And even as an end user, hey, if you're going to do it in your garage with your buddies with some you know, Hellcat parts that you're going to swap onto yeah. your diesel for an exhaust, like, meh, yeah. uh, okay, I've seen people do dumber. Yeah. Um, but to go to a shop and for a shop owner to take on that liability where they're like, hey, yeah, I know none of us have to test our emissions, but if the EPA walks in, yeah. um, it's done-zo. Yeah. It's, it's just it. It's done-zo. It's, it's, 
it, it's a wild time. And mm-hmm. I think I think one of the things we're seeing after a lot of this backlash, because I know at the beginning of COVID, EPA went hard on enforcement. Oh, yeah. Everybody started getting letters. They stopped even showing up. They just started sending requests for information. It's just oh. certified mail. Um, and, and we're starting to get to the tail end of it. Some of the big names who have who've been kind of dragged through all of this process, they're starting to get to the end of it. Yeah. Um, and EOs are finally starting to come out. So, so like I said, Duramax has, or Duramax Tuner has a huge swath of Duramax products, uh, tuning products that are have an EO number. Uh, we have one power stroke, the 2020 2021 Bench Flash. So, if you send in your ECM, we are legally, for California purposes, allowed to bench flash yep. your ECM and ship it back to you. Um, and then for the Cummins, we get the 15 to 20 on three different tuning platforms, which is great. Uh, we're, we're starting to see that we could build that up. Uh, it turns out a ton of listeners in California, Chris. Yeah. I don't know uh, how much we shared like the state-by-state no. state stats with you. One of our largest listening segments. Guys, if you're in California, we'd love for you to do us a favor. Jump on over to Fans of Diesel Performance Podcast Facebook page or Facebook group. Uh, share us a message. What's it like loving diesel performance in California? Do you guys ha- still have Diesel trucks at the drag strip. Like, you still do you, love them? is there is there <laughs> still is there the still a fan base out there in California after all of this enforcement? Uh, what do you guys do uh, when emissions equipment fails? That's another one mm-hmm. I'm always interested in. He, here, even in the Midwest where we're at, Chris, um, that most counties have emissions testing. Yeah. So uh, I'd say a large spot. The closer east to the city you got, yeah. No, uh, here in Northern Illinois, the more likely true. it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's even. Um, it's still interesting to me around here where we don't have a lot of like on the road enforcement. There's not a lot of like no. local enforcement pulling people over, checking for, for deletes. Right. But outside of Alberta, or I'm sorry, outside of Toronto. Yeah. No, it's a different story. Much more likely. So, yeah. so all over the, 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 the you know, the map, it, it could be very different just well, depending on how much money people want to milk out of you. It's crazy, you know, to talk about like our specific area, right? Like some of the surrounding counties, very spotty with testing, yeah. but you could be in an, in a county unincorporated and there's no testing, right? So it's it's very very spotty and it's very <laughs> questionable. And you've seen that get a little bit more common for testing over the years, and it's it's only going to get worse, right? Yeah. We, we all know that, right? That's just the way the the cookie crumbles in a sense. But uh, you know, it's just it's crazy to me. You know, bordering counties even over the state line where we're at, Illinois to Wisconsin, a lot of the bordering counties in Wisconsin a couple of years ago didn't, and then they they started having you know emissions testing. So it's like yeah. you're starting to see that take place. You're starting to see that take shape. It's almost so. like these small government organizations start seeing that there's money to be made right. by handing out fines and oh, tickets, yeah. and it's a really really easy revenue source. Yeah. And you also can completely bend people over a barrel because they can't get their plates and they can't get yep. their registration renewed until they go through your testing uh, and pay the fees to do that and all of those things. So it is it, it is one of those situations that I think um, I think I, I think we're, we're over that hurdle of is the industry going to survive? I think everybody knows diesel performance is here to stay. This is going to survive. Yeah. How it survives is by still giving people that amazing experience that they're looking for. That's why you buy a turbocharger. That's why you buy tuning. That's why you buy bigger injectors. You want a different experience driving your truck. I think a lot of those goals are still very, very possible. Uh, we just had to go about them in an all-new way. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, uh, thank you so much for listening. This has been Paul Wilson. And Chris Emke. This was Diesel Performance Podcast. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Uh, This has been Paul Wilson. And Chris Emke. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll talk to you again soon. Gray area (laughs) over the last, (laughs) you know, year or so. So...